Please be seated. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Mayfield. You ready? All right, we're ready for Mr. and Mrs. Wimbush. morning all right we're on the record in the state of Georgia versus Ricardo Leonard Wimbush and Terry and Cornelia Wimbush 16 B four zero 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 dash three we're here for a sentencing this morning present in the court on behalf of the state of Georgia is Dan Mayfield each of the defendants are both present in court they are each pro se um, also for purposes of the record their standby counsel are present in the court should they need to invoke their services at any time during the sentencing hearing. Uh, first, I will hear from the state regarding any evidence in aggravation. All right, very good. Ms. Chancey, if you'll come forward. Will you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is important matter now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to go God. I do. What is your name and where are you in Florida? Uh, my name is Leanne Chancy. I'm a self-employed attorney uh, licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia. As you previously testified in this case, you're the guardian ad litem for the 10 children, uh, the, the uh, children of the defendants in this case. I am. I, I have been since June 19th of 2014, and I continue in that role today. In that capacity, um, and having worked with the children, do you believe that you have valuable information for the court regarding the conditions of probation in this case? I do. What's the basis of your your request to be heard today? Um, I have met individually with all ten of the children. Uh, nine of them are verbal. One is still very young and, and doesn't really remember the circumstances of being removed. And I've also had an opportunity to um, receive information and updates regarding uh, the children's mental health care, uh, counseling, their behavior. Uh, I'm regularly updated by both DFACs and the placements where the children's children live. And I also meet with the children as regularly as possible, even though they are some distance away. Will the defendant's conditions of probation affect the ongoing well-being of the children in the state of I, I believe that they will judge. Um, the, informa the information that I've received uh, in representing the children from mental health professionals is that um, contact with the parents could be detrimental to the children. Um, the, beyond the children testifying, um, the children have had no contact with their parents since uh, June of 2014. I did have the opportunity to meet with each of the Wimbush children after the nine of them testified. Um, 
Many of the children were in tears after their testimony. Um, Ricardo Wimbush Jr. Jr. in particular um, became very um, closed off. He did not want to speak with anyone. He was really much similar to the day that I first met him uh, in June of 2014. Um, I, I felt like the um, him testifying was very traumatic for him, and he's going to be seen by his counselor to try to process that. Um, but the information that we've I've received through investigating the circumstances of this family is that um, the Wimbushes, although they communicated in, in English, um, sometimes use words that are different than what we, I would expect them to use and that it would be very easy potentially for the parents to say something that even if the conversation was supervised might seem innocuous to the supervisor, it could have meaning to the children and negatively impact them. Um, I will tell the court that regarding Ricardo Wimbush Jr., he absolutely wants contact with both of his parents. Um, he specifically tells uh, me that he misses his conversations with them. He misses being able to speak with them. Uh, and all 10 of the Wimbush children want contact with their parents. Um, but in my opinion, as their guardian ad litem as to what is their best interest, uh, I would be asking the court that you not allow contact until the children turn 18 and that you allow the children to be in control of the contact that they have. Um, particularly, Ricardo Wimbush Jr. has had no control in his relationship with his parents. Um, and so I would ask the court to craft a condition of probation that the parents are to have no contact with the children until they turn 18. And then at that point, the children in writing to probation or parole, however the court fashions their sentence, um, can initiate contact. And then the children have the opportunity to, it, in writing, um, discontinue that contact if they choose. Um, and that would allow the, the children, once they reach the age of majority, to control uh, what, whatever relationship they choose to have with their parents. And they, these children have had no control at all. And there are some of them, particularly Joy and Hope, that are very angry about that. Um, and so I did assure them that I would tell the court that they wanted contact. Um, but the, the girl, the female children, after they testified, um, were all but one of them were in tears. Uh, they were not prepared for the way that they would feel about testifying. Um, they all thought that it was good to see their parents, but they did not understand why they were not permitted to speak freely um, in their testimony. And it, it just appeared to have an impact on each of the children that were called to testify, which I know that nine of them were. Uh, have we prepared a proposed condition of probation yes. that reflects your feelings on this matter? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes, the proposed language is as follows. The defendant shall have no contact with the defendant's children, to wit, Ezekiel Wimbush, Faith Wimbush, Hope Wimbush, Jeremiah Wimbush, Joy Wimbush, Love Wimbush, Patience Wimbush, there's a typo, it should be Patience Wimbush rather than Mary Wimbush, Serenity Wimbush, Isaiah Wimbush, and Ricardo, Ricardo Wimbush Jr. unless the child has reached the age of 18 and the child initiates contact with the defendant. In such case, the defendant shall only respond once to each communication and shall never initiate any form of communication. The defendant shall never communicate with any of the said children through any third party. The defendant shall not communicate with any legal custodian or guardian of the defendant's children as long as any child remains in the custody uh, or, or care of the guardian. Now, what is the purpose for having no contact with the guardians and custodians? Uh, at this point, the, the Wimbush children are placed with three separate 
sets of relatives and um, they're absent the fact that they want to go home they are happy and they're thriving in the placements that they are in and um, I do not I, I fear that if the parents have repeated contact and try to influence the, those placements and those guardians that it may negatively impact the children's ability to stay in the home that, that eventually it could just become such a burden on the parents sort of fending off this contact or a burden on the placement fending off this contact by the parents that it, it may disrupt the placements that the children have and and while the children do want to be home these placements they are thriving in them they love the relatives that they're placed with and I don't want to do anything I don't want the parents to do anything to negatively impact that thank you that's all I have your just one question before I turn to the Wimbushes. How, <clears throat> if I were to adopt this language and the separate juvenile court proceedings r reach a resolution that is in conflict with that, how do you propose that that would be resolved or have, have you taken that into consideration? I have, Judge. For one, um, the children in the juvenile proceedings will conclude at the point that the children reach the age of majority or the children have the option to sign themselves in back into DFAX care until I believe they're the age of 21. Um, and in juvenile court, I, we will make the judge in juvenile court aware of this court's order, and he will, do, he will not, the judge in juvenile court will not do anything that contravenes the order of this court. Um, and at this point in juvenile court, the um, the the only con the parents are not allowed to contact the children. The children are allowed to write letters to the parents, which this order would not uh, impact the children's ability to do so. But they're, um, the the parents, as I said, have had no contact with the children since 2014, uh, and the, that court, the juvenile court, would have to cede to this court's jurisdiction and whatever is written in the order of this court. All right, very good. Let me inquire. Well, one other question. Ms. Chancey, would it be accurate to say that the what happens here and in juvenile court, the more restrictive of the two will be in place until they come out of jurisdiction, such as this would only be in effect so long as the defense are in custody or on probation, and the jurisdictional limits of juvenile court will end you know, on, on its own schedule different from this. But for that time that, that both orders are concurrent, the more restrictive of the two will apply. Correct. That's all I have, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wimbush, any questions for Ms. Chancey? All right, I'll need you to come to the podium for me, please. Okay. Well, Ms. Chancey, how are you doing today? Good morning, thank you. Uh, good. So if the on the juvenile side of the case, if the judge decides not to, I guess, uh, overturn this decision, say we were to get out, you know, we have a, another dependency hearing or another hearing as far as being able to regain contact with the children, what would be your, what would be your suggestion, I guess, as far as dealing with that? Well, which, uh, if there are two orders and they vary, and say the court orders what I'm requesting here and say the juvenile court turns course and, and says that you can have contact, the, that's what Mr. Mayfield was asking about. The more restrictive would control. So my, as an attorney, my suggestion to, to you would be to follow whichever order is the more restrictive on your contact with the children so that you're not either subject to a violation of probation here, if that's the case, or subject to contempt in juvenile court. Okay, and you say the children's uh, their thoughts and their feelings about, they want to they be able to kind of have contact with their parents, you know, do you think it's, say the, the courts decide, you know, that it would be okay as long as the juvenile courts are okay with it, as long as this court's okay with it, you think it would be possible or you think it would be beneficial for them to have contact with their parents? The children, absolutely all 10 of them want contact with you and their mother immediately. I'm, I'm not going to say anything other. They have consistently maintained that they want contact with their children mm -hmm. or with their parents. It is my 
opinion based on the evidence that I have obtained, have obtained being their guardian ad litem, that contact is until before they are the age of majority would not be in their best interest for several different reasons. Um, it can negatively impact their mental health. It could negatively impact the placements in which they are placed in. Uh, it could cause them to act out, um, to intentionally disrupt their placements in sort of a misguided hope that maybe they can get back to you and their mother. Um, but I, I don't want to restrict their contact with you forever. I want them to be in control. Once they've reached an age which they can assess the situation, I want them to be in control. And if they're if they choose to have contact with you, I want them to be able to do so. And but at their young age, at this point, I don't believe it's it's in their best interest. And at the age of 18, so I guess there being no contact, say, between the time the one's three years old now, so 15 years, I guess, what kind of relationship will there be to build? You know, that at that point in time, it's been 15 years for the youngest and two years for the oldest, you know, since varying ranges in between, you know, what kind of, I guess, truly beneficial, how would it be beneficial for them to, I guess, not have any contact during that time? Well, particularly for the younger children, the goal of the juvenile court is to reach a state of permanency for the children. Right. Um, and if there is no contact and the children are allowed to build relationships and allowed to see that this, that their, whether it's their placement, that their living arrangements are going to be permanent, it allows the children to gain sort of a sense of permanency, it allows them to build a family unit with whoever they are living with, and, and I don't know what the circumstances of your and Mrs. Wimbush, is, the, your incarceration circumstances right. may be, and I want the children, particularly the younger children, to gain a sense of permanency. Um, working in juvenile court, I have seen children that were removed at a young age that come back in as an adult and build a relationship with their biological children. You see people that were adopted out that seek out their biological parents and they build meaningful relationships and it's at the control, it's at the, the discretion or the control of the, of the child once they've reached an age where they can, where they can do so and they, they can deal with it. Right. Um, I understand that. And I guess uh, would writing be okay? I guess they were to be sentenced to prison for X amount of years. I guess would writing be an okay form or is that not allowed? I mean, and, that, and everything can be, I guess, supervised and extent. There is no code language, but uh, you know, I guess just trying to understand, you know, we're already going through the process, you know, how everything has to be filtered through juvenile court already, you know, as far as writing the children. And uh, so I guess is writing something that would be permissible, I guess, if decided upon. I mean, obviously the judge will make the decision. The, the recommendation that I'm requesting for is no, that I've been requesting is no contact until the age of 18 and upon initiation by the, by the child. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Wimbush, any questions for Ms. Chancey? Um, <clears throat> perhaps. Ms. Chancey, are you um, familiar with the, uh, and the, this may be totally kind of off base, are you familiar with the attachment theory? Uh, I am. I'm not a mental health professional, but it comes up in juvenile court on a fairly regular basis. Okay. You said you're not a mental health professional? Correct. Okay. And so without you being a mental health professional, do you deem that you are qualified to make such a determination without a mental health professional actually uh, participating in such a decision? My recommendation comes from my review of the mental health records. It comes from testimony of mental health experts that have taken the witness stand in juvenile court. It comes from my speaking with your children. Uh, and so I, in, this, in this situation, I do believe I'm qualified to make this recommendation. I've conducted a sifting evaluation of all the, the um, information available about these children. 
Right, and you said, so when they were removed from their home um, and they were not allowed any contact with their parents, although they were supposed to have contact within seven days of being removed from their home, um, would it, it have been the exact same circumstances that it should have been uh, a desire on the part of the agency or on the part of juvenile court to ensure that those children maintain um, contact with their parents during that time? The juvenile court has, the, the order of the juvenile court has always been that the children should have no contact with the parents. I don't have any control over uh, the policies of the department, but the juvenile court can always override a defects policy if it believes that that's what is in the best interest of the children. And so the, the order of the juvenile court <coughs> has always been an order of no contact. Do you recall that the initial order of the juvenile court um, from the June 19th hearing of 2014 that the actual order was that the children were to have supervised visitation with their parents? I'd be happy to take a look at that order, but I don't recall that. No. Okay. Um, now, as I consider, and I don't know if this is argument or more question, as I consider the um, your recommendation. Um, do you recall that the that the dependency in the juvenile case is based solely on our, the parents' incarceration without bond and without a, tri a trial date set? I do recall that you and Mr. Winbush um, entered into a stipulation stipulating to dependency on those grounds. Mm -hmm. um, however, we conducted, I believe, a seven-day trial regarding disposition in the case. And after that, that series of hearings, the juvenile court um, found that reunification with the parents would not be in the children's best interest and pursuant to that order I do know that the juvenile court ordered that there be no contact with the parents. Okay and that and you do understand that that order can be vacated? Well the Court of Appeals has affirmed it. Um, there is one issue for cert that has not, cert has not been either denied or granted on that one issue. Okay. But the last order we have is an affirmance from the Court of Appeals. But are you aware that that still can be vacated. Sure, the Supreme Court okay. of Georgia could vacate it, but at this point the petition for cert has been up for several weeks and has not been granted. Okay, and in, in the termination petition that's filed in juvenile court, um, is the basis of that termination petition also the stipulation to dependency? Well, the court found pursuant to the trial that we had regarding disposition that aggravated circumstances existed. And aggravated, cir aggravated circumstances are outlined in um, the Juvenile Code 1511-103, I believe. I don't have the numbers memorized. Um, but the, the petition for termination is based on the stipulation that was entered. It was based on the court's finding of aggravated circumstances. It was based on the court's finding that no reunification would be in the best interest of the children. Uh, it was based on, um, I, I'm, I expect that it will be updated to reflect the fact that you and Mr. Wimbush have now been convicted of felony cruelty to children charges. Um, and so that the, the petition to terminate your parental rights was based on the totality of the circumstances in this case. Right, and based on the um, legal code, um, which uh, lays, a lays out the, conditions for termination, one of the first conditions is that you've got to prove dependency. Um, the dependency in that, in this case, as, as far as the, uh, the initial dependency and the dependency that's identified in the termination petition is based on the stipulation due to our incarceration um, without bail and uh, waiting trial. With that um, being the basis of dependency and us being out on probation, that does that not change the um, the present dependency? Did you understand my question? Well, that was. Oh. I, I think that I did. Okay. And the court, even though you you simply stipulated, but on on limited bases, the court can find. Uh, that dependency continues on in a termination 
hearing, you're not just bound by the prior dependency case. The court can find that termination is, ba is in the children's best interest based on a number of factors to include the prior findings of aggravated circumstances, to include the prior findings of dependency, to, um, to include new findings of dependency. Um, and, and as I said, I, I don't know what the circumstances of your incarceration or probation will be. That will be up to this judge. Is it correct that um, the finding of dependency must be based on present deprivation or present dependency, not based on past? It is based on present dependency. Termination of parental rights can be based on a finding of aggravated circumstances, whether it is continuing or present. And there has been a very clear finding of aggravated circumstances in this case in the Juvenile Court of Gwinnett County. Okay. It can also be based on a parent being convicted of cruelty to one of the children and, and you have now been convicted of cruelty to children. Right. Is, is it true that cruelty to children is one of them or is it more or less manslaughter and, and those types of things? I don't recall cruelty to children being one of those. I the aggravated circumstances takes into account any conviction right, right, for right. an ab abuse of a child. Right. Is it possible, Ms. Chancey, that a conviction can be overturned? It certainly can. Okay. And that would change the circumstances. Is that correct? I don't believe so. The court in juvenile court has already found aggravated circumstances in this case prior to your conviction. And I believe that the court can determine, a t that the court can grant a termination of your parental rights solely based on that finding of aggravated circumstances. It actually, is it not is it true that it has to find that the court has to find dependency, present dependency? It also has to find that the dependency. Uh, do you know? Let me ask you. Do you know what the statutory requirements are to terminate parental rights? I don't have them memorized. I'd be happy okay. to look at the statute. Okay. And Ms. Wimbush, I'm, I'm not sure how that is helpful to the court's determination of what sentence to impose here. This is not a termination of parental rights hearing. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. Is it okay for me to? Okay. What I was trying to get at earlier, um, Judge Fluker, is that if it were that you placed stipulations of our relationship with our children um, here in Superior Court, uh, knowing, knowing that there are termination proceedings that are in place, it would severely prejudice us in those termination proceedings, especially given the fact that the only basis for dependency in this case to even reach a point of non-reunification, et cetera, was based on our, the fact that we were incarcerated without bail and awaiting trial. I understand what your argument is. Okay. But I, was just, I just want you to understand what I was getting at. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I do briefly. Can you just, I don't want to continue to put the children's names on the record. So if you can follow me along on your list with the order that you have. Um, E.W., a male child. Can you help me with the ages? I'm just going to go down. And if you can help me with their ages, starting with the order that they're listed in your suggested paragraph. Yes, ma'am. I believe that he... I don't know if he is yet five. Okay, yes. approximately five. Approximately five. All right, FW, a female. She is, she will be 12, I believe, next month. HW, a female. She is 13. Or actually, she's 14. I'm sorry, Judge. I don't have their birth dates memorized. I just need approximate. And JW, the next, a male child. He is uh, eight turning nine. JW, a female child? Fifteen. LW, a female child? She is a twin to FW, so she is uh, 11 turning 12, 12 years old. PW, a female? Uh, she is turning four, I believe. SW, a female, is six years old. And then IW, a male, he is 10. And then RW, a male, is 16. All right, any other questions for Ms. Chancey, Ms. Mather? All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in ag aggravation? No, Your Honor. All right, um, arguments, or do you want me to? 
um, first turn to the defense for their presentation before you make your recommendation. All right, Mr. Um, Wimbush, this would be your opportunity to first to present any mitigation that you wish me to consider through witnesses or argument. Mr. Okay, come, come forward, ma'am. I'll go ahead and swear you in. If you raise your right hand for me, do you swear or affirm any testimony or evidence you'll offer to this court on the matter now pending will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do, Your Honor. All right, thank you. If you'll please state your name and spell first and last name for me, please. My name is Doris, D A R I C E. My last name is Good with no E on the end. Thank you. Mr. Right. Wimbush. How are you doing, Mr. Doris? I'm good, Mr. Wimbush. Thank you. Uh oh. What is your participation in this case? I am actually the direct attorney for children's JW, HW, FW, LW, JW, IW, and EW. So a, the two through nine, essentially. Um, I am their direct attorney in the juvenile court. I represent the children's direct interests and wants in the juvenile court matter. And I've been their direct attorney since June of 2014. Uh, so what would be your recommendation as far as the children in contact or visitation with the parents? Well, <clears throat> just to set up, I am, um, to have you understand why I'm coming at my recommendations. I am a National Child Welfare Law Specialist. I'm certified by the National Association of Counsel for Children. I'm also a member of the Parents' Representations um, Steering Committee for the American Bar Association, which handles national child welfare issues. Um, I was intricate in the seven years of the passage of the Juvenile Code. I was the co-chair for the Juvenile Committee. I sat pro tem on the Juvenile Court of Fulton County. I was the 2015 Juvenile Court Attorney of the Year for Georgia. And um, in my experience of 16 years, I don't ever think that there is situations where children should not absolutely have contact with their parents. I think that some qualify, but I don't think this is one. And here is why. All the research I have, um, the National Institute for Health, um, Dr. Reckman's, Dr. Reinstein's, the um, American Bar Association, um, all of them recommend that what we don't understand with children is removal is just as traumatic from their parents, no matter what their parents did. And the child's bond develops, and since I am a National Child Welfare Law Specialist, this is part of my studying to be that. Um, the bond that develops, good, bad, um, or indifferent, is one that the children cling to. And when children come into foster care, there are certain things that we can see as to whether or not the children are, um, have been in circumstances where their development, their needs were not nurtured in their family. In my career, I have never seen Ten children, the eight of mine in, in particular, cope with removal better than any other children. And they coped with not just removal, but being separated as siblings. These are children that for 11 years lived together in the same home with the same parents. Their parents, prior to this incident, had no criminal history. Um, they were, you know, hardworking parents. They um, really were, did well in foster care. Um, there were some times where they didn't do well um, when there was a lapse in therapy. We had about a, a three year, excuse me, eight week lapse in therapy for the oldest. Um, but these are children who are used to being with this family and we, in, in homeschooled. So you've, you've taken them from their home, you've taken them from their school, and they've done very well. These are amazing, intelligent children. 
I, I asked them when I first met with them about the trial we were having. I said, well, um, the, some prior attorneys were asking about depositions, and I said, well, do you know what a deposition is? And of course, children, they don't. And I said, well, do you know what the court reporter is? Do you mind if they take down what you say? And they, they're like, yeah, the scribe. The scribe takes down what you, and I was like amazed. You know, when I first read this story, I was like, oh, this child's locked in a basement. But then we hear they, they sleep in the same room. They have a knitting room. These kids knit. When they came into care, they started knitting and decided that they wanted to raise money to help people. So they started knitting things and then selling them at school to their friends. And they had their little money pouches and knew exactly like the change and how much everything was going to cost. Um, you know, they had a playroom. They had a book room. If, if the basement that that I don't know if was shown, you know is there's a workout room but there's like kids pictures paints everywhere all these you know things that the children had drawn um and the kids throughout their time have said and done things to me that if they're not if, if this had been a horrific horrible household you wouldn't have seen these things in the, in the children in my opinion um, you wouldn't have seen these really intelligent children. Um, and most of all, and, and this just goes to show you, I talked with all my clients last night and their caregivers. And I, I t the girls were much more vocal than the boys. Ms. Ms. Chancy was correct. Of course, they all want their parents to be released. They all want contact with their parents. Um, a year ago when we did our trial, Joy, the, or excuse me, JW, the oldest female, um, stated to the court there that she's angry because the case managers keep telling me they understand what I'm going through being separated from my parents, but they do not. I'm confused and scared when I was removed. And that's the thing is that the first thing the girls, I said, what do you want me to tell the judge? We want you to tell her that we feel as if no one is considering what we're going through. And these are children who told me yesterday they, they prefer homeschooling because in their exact words, that there's kids, there's other kids who talk too much and we want them to be quiet because we are missing out on our education. JW, or excuse me, HW, who is probably the most vocal of all the girls said yesterday to me, it's like that saying in, to kill a mockingbird, that quote. And she said, you cannot judge anyone else unless you have walked in their shoes. And I didn't want to go, I didn't want to explain, well, she is the judge. That is her job to judge people. But I wanted, Your Honor, to have an opportunity to really walk in these children's shoes. They are um, wanting their parents home. They believe what their parents did was wrong. Each and every one of them have told me that. They say that our parents did what was best for us, even though it was wrong. We want the court to take that into consideration. Nobody is perfect, and they are human and going to make offense. This is their first offense. Um, and we want the court to consider how it affects all of us kids. <laughs> and then Hope went on to say that, it, and, and actually the research, Your Honor, backs this. <laughs> she went on to say that if we don't have contact with our parents, parent, kids can get upset, they can turn suicidal um, without having contact with them. That's actually true. There is more likely in children who are separated from their parents and have no contact whatsoever. I did make sure to let the children know that they may or may not ever be reunited with their parents and, and living with them. 
but they do tend to suffer more from um, substance abuse, depression, drug abuse. And as far as, you know, the kids, I believe it was that the kids were testifying, you know, and how the testimony affected them just showed that it was, I, I believe it was bad for them to have contact. The kids were not happy about testifying. Um, those kids I heard and I had to actually stop. The, I didn't come to court after the, the first boys testified because it was emotionally too hard for me because... Objection, Your Honor. I, I just don't see the relevance of proportional reaction. Uh, I'll be fine. All right, if you're just... Uh, it's, it's just the kids that I heard were not the kids that I recognized. Um, in their tone, in their voice. They didn't like testifying, that was for sure. But it, it, it also didn't affect their exuberance when I talked to them yesterday. They were once again the kids that I've come to know. Um, the custodians of the children, the Virgil Wimbush and, and Ronald Wimbush, they they didn't state to me any any issue with the children having contact. Um, I do think the children should have contact. Um, th the kids do want their parents released. They said that um, they their parents have been in jail in two and a half years, and that was the same amount of time their oldest brother was supposedly in the basement, as they said it. Um, you know, they stated that, you know, how did their, how did, if, if our parents are so bad, how did they manage to raise us and us doing so well? Um, I do believe that these children should be allowed to contact with their parents, whether that's in writing, in telephone calls, in supervised visitations. Um, at the testimony of, in the disposition, um, and I, I won't go through, but unless Your Honor wants me to, neither, none of their therapists testified that it would be detrimental to have contact. They in fact testified, well, we don't really know the children that well, um, and we need more time with them. There was, um, visitation was allowed for the first five months by the court order. The department didn't follow that court order. Since September of 2014, there's been no contact until the last court hearing in the, in the summertime. Um, the court at that time did state that the parents could now write the children, although there was disagreement amongst the parties that the court stated that, so we're waiting on the transcript of that hearing. Um, but the children are allowed to write their parents and they do love their parents and I don't think for one minute any of us agree with what happened here. But I also don't think it's severe enough to not have any contact till the age of 18. None of the children want that and I don't think that would be healthy for them and they're already very, very angry with the system. Um, I had to explain to them why, you know, for the first time around there wasn't a speedy trial. Um, I'm afraid that the detrimental effects, and, and here's the thing, is we, we haven't seen in the times that the parents have gotten letters or even over the weekend any behavior by them actually seeing their parents for the first time that would suggest it was not a good thing. So, on behalf of my eight clients, which is EW through, and EW is almost six now, I think, it was stated he was four, through um, female JW, uh, they, they're asking for their parents to be released and for them to be able to have contact with them. They're very happy where they're living. These are, the family is exceptional, and this family is very equipped to take care of the bumps. Um, that will certainly, you know, come now and in the future, whether or not they have have contact with their parents. Thank you, Ms. Good. Mrs. Wimbush, any questions? Mr. Mayfield. Isn't it true that 
your job, your hired position requires you to represent what the children want, even if it's not in their best interest. That is correct. And is however, that however, my job is first a counselor to my clients, and therefore, my job is to also advise my clients of what I think is in their best interest. My job is solely for these children, and if I didn't think this was in their best interest, I would be at home watching this online. If you would be responsive to the question, rather than using my examination of you as a opportunity to speak beyond my question. Is that fair? Fair enough. All right. And isn't it also true that children, particularly of this age, frequently do not know what's in their own best interest? Isn't that one of the nature of being a child? Yes. And isn't it also part of the nature of being a child that even if you know what's in your best interest, they have a very difficult time, much more so than a mature adult, in conforming their behavior to actually what they know, what they know is in their best interest? I would disagree with that. So you believe that children don't need rules then to, to force themselves to do things that, that they know is not in their self-interest, but they don't want to do it, well, such as doing their homework? I think that there are some children that do their homework because they like to do their homework and they're going to do their homework whether there's a rule in place or not. Right. That's some children on homework. Other children that have a problem with overeating, they know they're not supposed to overeat, but they continue to overeat right. because as a child, they don't have maturity to choose what they know is right for them. So first of all, they don't always know what's right. Correct. Second of all, they frequently do not choose to do what is right. Therefore, adults courts and other people have to impose things upon them that they don't want in their own best interest. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes. And wouldn't you agree that these children have done very well in their foster care? Yes, and but I'd like to explain that answer. Go ahead. Children, and I have represented thousands in 16 years. Children do well in foster homes based upon a plethora of circumstances. The foster parents, whether they're with their siblings, but also based upon how they were raised in their own home. Right. Most children... I'm responsive. This was dealing with these children in foster care. She's talking about thousands of children that she's represented, and it's not responsive. I can address these children, Your Honor. That's good. Yes, if you'll just answer the question that's being asked, please. Have these children done very well in foster care? Yes, partially due to how well they were raised. And isn't it true that you don't know if they would have done this well in foster care if they're receiving one message from their parents on one hand and other messages from their foster parents on the other hand causing disruption? That can be a very negative impact on the placement, can't it? That's speculation. I don't know. I don't know if they would have done better. We've, ha we've had our ups and downs in the last two years. So you don't know? No other question. Any follow-up, Mr. Wimbush? Mrs. Can you explain, Ms. Good, what you meant by over the past two years we've had our ups and downs? Yes. The children, when they came into care, therapeutic services were not put in place between June and September of 2014. In October, November, there were lapses in those therapeutic services, and one child, as a result, threatened suicide and was hospitalized in a psychiatric facility. You also stated that 
um, there was a court order in place between June 2014 and September of 2014 um, that the parents were supposed to have supervised visitation with the children. Is that correct? Yeah, and the children were supposed to have supervised visitation with the parents. And did this happen? No. Um, is it typical in your experience that during, during the first seven days or during such a period of time, June to September, that children continue to thrive in foster care though they've not had any visitation with their parents? In my experience, rarely do children thrive in foster care. And rarely do children thrive without some type of contact from their parents. Ms. Good, um, what do you think, or in your opinion, would be the result of if the parents were released on probation and the children could have absolutely no contact with their parents until the age of 18? Again, it... it I'm objecting, I don't think she's qualified. She's an attorney. She, I don't believe that she has a qualification. I, I don't feel that you've laid a proper foundation for that question, Mrs. Wimbush. Okay. Um, based on your training, do you feel that these children, if they were to have, to have contact with their parents, that it would negatively impact their mental health? Sustain. Ms. Good, do you have any psychological training? In order to be certified as a National Child Welfare Law Specialist, we are required to essentially take a second bar exam. That bar exam includes not just law, it includes psychological development, behavioral development, brain development, physiology development. Um, it also includes uh, legal training, obviously, training on um, agency department policies and practice. Um, that's why they call us a child welfare law specialist, because it is um, a, a plethora of what is always, you know, everything that affects the child, educationally, culturally. Um, I also have probably 45 hours of training a year that I either teach or do. Those include classes on children's behavioral health, mental health. So am I a doctor? No. Am I a psychologist? No. Am I a therapist? No. Um, but yes, I, I do understand to the best of my ability and what I have studied and continued to study throughout my career, children's behavioral and mental, mental development because it's part of my job. Okay. Were you able to hear Ms. Chansey's testimony? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, in her testimony, do you recall that she said um, that, the that if the children were able to have contact with their parents that it would negatively impact their mental health? Yes. Do you agree with that statement? Well, as phrased, I sustain it. She's not qualified to give that answer if she wants to answer based on her review of medical records. That is one thing, but to give her opinion of that, I sustain the objection. Thank you. Um, have you had an opportunity to review medical and psychological records of these children? 
I have reviewed all the children's psychological evaluations, all the children's trauma assessments, all of the children's um, comprehensive family and children assessments, all the schools, all the children's educational assessments, all of their grades, all of the therapeutic notes um, by the several different therapists, and all of their medical records. And based on your review of all those records, um, do you feel that these children having contact with their parents would negatively impact their mental health? Well, it is the same opinion that you sought out from Ms. Chancey based on her review of the records as well. My objection is that this is not the uh, and the question didn't even refer to the records. The question referred to her opinion, and that's what I objected. Well, I believe she said after your review of the records, so the objection is overruled. Go ahead and answer this, good. I think for both of us to say so is partly speculative. Um, but no. These children are extremely strong, intelligent, balanced children. And I am not here to, to be a cheerleader for you and, and Mr. Wimbush. I'm here to be a cheerleader for my eight clients. And having said that, I think that the children should have contact with their parents. I think, however, that needs to be closely monitored. And if there is significant issues, then that can be adjusted. We've got a long way to go in the juvenile court before this is said and done. Um, but I, I think these children are balanced enough to have contact with their parents and not fly off the deep end. I mean, that it, it lacks credit in, in these children to say that you know, they're, they're so unstable or unbound. I mean, if they're thriving, then we know that, that they have it within them to do that. I, my position is, let's do that and let's monitor it. Are you using as a basis for your opinion the fact that they were take, taken from their home that they were, they had no contact at all with anyone that they knew from all their full upbringing, very little contact with their siblings. Are you basing your opinion um, on, as a form of comparison, on their ability to, to, to thrive even in that circumstance? Well, the children are resilient. I mean, they didn't have contact with their siblings for the first four months either. So these children, through all of that, have gotten good grades, have had good behavior, have done, you know, started band and things that kids do. You do not see that all the time in foster care unless the kids had, you know, from zero to three is when children's brain develops, when they discover their flight and flight, excuse me, flight, fright and, and flight complex fight and flight complex. And th these children, excepting the youngest, were all of that age. That, that's really when you, over that age when they came into care, that's when you develop so much of your strength of character, your what's in your best interest, what's not, you know, good, bad. I if that is damaged during that time, you're not going to see these children thrive like they have. Thank you, Ms. Good. You're welcome. Mr. Mayfield? Each and every one of the Wimbush children knew that Ricardo was locked alone in a room in a basement with no interaction with them and was exiled from the family. Every one of those children knew that. And every one of those children knew it was because of their parents. Was that a good or a negative influence on their life? That's overruled. In my discussions with the children, was it a first answer to the question? Was the fact that those children knew that their parents had locked their sibling away from them for 
all those many months, was it a good or a bad influence on their life to see their parents do that? I cannot answer the question because the facts that you just stated are not the facts that the children believe or are aware of. Are you telling this court that the children did not know that the part of their sibling was snatched away and locked in a basement room by himself and they stopped seeing him from that day forward until defects came and rescued? Are you telling the court that the children didn't know that? The children knew that Ricardo was locked in the basement room. Okay. Now, was that a good or a bad influence on their life to know that their parents, at a whim, for being disobedient, can lock any one of them in a closet by themselves for months? Is that a good or a bad influence? That is absolutely a bad influence. Right. I don't and disagree do you with think you. That those people should be able to reinforce those beliefs in those children as they are being raised in this foster care. Would that be helpful or detrimental to them? I think that speculation because, first of all, we don't know, again, I think the children should have contact with their parents. I think it should be supervised, and I think that it should be closely watched. And no, I do not think their parents should those things but I don't know if they will if we look at these children's lives we're talking about one incident and I agree that it's horrible I am looking at the totality of these children's lives with this family not that one incident when I recommend what I think the and really what I think is best but more importantly what these children want yeah we have to have these children are the reason we're here the reason I'm here is because I'm their voice. They're the most important people who are not in this room. And you are here to represent what they want. Yes. No other question. All right, you can step down, Ms. Good. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wimbush, any other witnesses for you? Mrs. Wimbush, do you have any witnesses to call? No. All right, so the um, testimony portion Your Honor, I think what he's wanting is um, I represent um, Mr. Winbush. Can you identify yourself for the record? Um, Alex Manning. I represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and I formerly represented Mr. Winbush. And I'm appointed by Judge Davis also in the Grant County Juvenile Court Penalty Action, and I am assisting Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case. Mr. Winbush, you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush in the juvenile case, and you represent Mr. Winbush I think he would simply like us to make a statement to him. He's not going to waive the attorney client privilege. Well, it's, it's going it's to be under oath or it's not going to be at all. He's representing himself for purposes of this hearing. Sure. Sure. The record will reflect that the court is allowing Mr. Wimbush to confer um, with counsel from juvenile court. And Mrs. Wimbush is requesting to confer with standby counsel, Mr. Geary, which she will be permitted to do. All right, Mr. Wimbush, any other witnesses on your behalf? No, Your Honor. Mrs. Wimbush, any witnesses you wish to call on your behalf? No, Your All right, so the testimony portion is closed. Uh, Mr. Mayfield, let me turn to you for your recommendation. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I hope to approach this proposed sentence in a logical manner. I want to start with count three. Count three the defendant's being convicted of causing cruel and excessive mental pain upon Ricardo Jr. by confining said room and a child for months without sufficient mental stimulation and social interaction. Your Honor, we've seen the conditions uh, upon which they place their, their, own their own child in, in that room. 
uh, the maximum penalty available for cruelty to children in the second degree is 10 years. Based upon the irreparable harm to that child and in, in the interest of justice, the state is requesting that the defendants be sentenced to 10 years each for count three to bring justice for Ricardo Wimbush Jr.'s case. As to count number seven, the defendants are convicted of, uh, of uh, causing Isaiah Wimbush cruel and excessive physical and mental pain by failing to seek medical, medical care for his abdominal skin cancer. Not only that, Your Honor, we know that, that this was a long-term, ongoing uh, obligation that they had to seek medical care for this cancer. And we know that it went for years with their failure to do so. We also know that Isaiah is, has already faced a biopsy, surgery, two years of chemotherapy, is next facing an even more extensive surgery, uh, a life-changing event, a potentially fatal cancer for Isaiah. I'm asking the court to sentence the defendants to 10 years incarceration consecutive to that and count number three. <clears throat> Lastly, as to count number four, I'm asking the court to sentence the defendants to 10 years of probation consecutive to the previous two counts, which result in a sentence of 30 years to serve 20 years incarceration, followed by 10 years of probation. During that 10 years of probation, I would ask that the court impose the special condition of probation that I submitted to the court earlier. Your Honor, the, the most startling thing about this case is, is the defendant's position that they have done nothing wrong. First, one must admit that they did something wrong. Then one must show some sort of an emotional and having seen neither from these defendants, then they have provided the court, I believe, no avenue for mercy, as they have shown us. Thank you, Mr. Mayfield. Mr. Wimbush, your response to the state's recommendation and anything you want to personally offer on your behalf in mitigation. Although I don't agree with the jury's verdict, I accept it, and I pray this court will have mercy upon this matter. No, I'm not a career criminal, and you know, nor have I had any prior convictions before this. And but uh, for this, you know, I was a father to ten children, a husband to this wonderful woman over here, and uh, I worked twelve-hour shifts on the railroad just to ensure that they had food and shelter and a place to stay. You know. Uh, I love I love each and every one of my children. I love them. I've been through their entrance into this world. You know, I got to see them birth, and I got to see uh, two long, strenuous hours of mom going through childbearing. And uh, you know, I've always wanted nothing but the best for them. That's been one thing. I just wanted them to be productive, kind, honest, caring, loving citizens. You know, I, over the last 16 years, I had a chance to get to know know them personally. You know, get to know what makes them tick. You know, their likes and their dislikes, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses, their personality and character traits. You know, and I and uh, I, I've learned some things from them as well as they taught me some things. And uh, during that time, I got to learn about them. I, I took pride pride in being a father, and uh, I'm proud to say that I am the father of those 10 wonderful children. Uh, they're phenomenal, you know. I'm not just saying that because they're mine, but they, they are just the most well-mannered, talented, polite, kind children you're ever going to meet. You know, as you've heard both Miss Chance and Miss Good say, you know, they're doing great in school. You know, that's, and that's one of the things we always told them to do is always do your best no matter what it is. You know, that's, you're going to be, a tuba player, be the best tuba player you can be. You can uh, play basketball, be the best basketball player you can be. Just commit the time and, and put the effort into it. Uh, 
all of them making A's and B's with one exception, you know, Hope, she's got, she's got one C, you know, she wasn't too excited about that, and you can see that and hear it from her expressions. And, uh, as far as what we did, you know, it wasn't right, you know, and Hope said, you know, we could have done things a little differently, yeah, and I, and I agree with her, we, we could have, you know, and I'm, and I'm willing and most definitely I'm hoping that the court will grant me the opportunity to, to, to be able to be re rehabilitated, to be able to be reformed, and to be able to be a parent to these children, if that is all, at all possible. Uh, you know, and the, the jury's verdict, you know, they said we were negligent, and I, I agree, you know, uh, but we weren't, it wasn't in any mali malicious intent at, at all, you know, it was just wanting what was best for them. Uh, just ask that you please don't hand my children over to the state, you know, and I ask for a chance for reunification. And I'll do that through education, uh, counseling sessions, parenting classes, uh, whatever it may take you on. I'll, I'll do anything to be able to be reunited with these, these children. Hey, if you, you hand a max sentence or the 30 to 20 as the DA is recommended, it's basically handing our children over to the juvenile court and not giving us a chance to or an opportunity to be parents to them until they're 18 years old and that's that, and that point they're grown, you know. And if you do that, Ms. Wallace is in court right now standing here and Ms. Chancey will terminate my rights and that is not what I want. And it would also kill my children's wishes to be reunited with their parents. You know, in uh, testimony, you got to see my children, and you got to see some of them cry, you know, just because they haven't seen their parents in over 31 months. And, and it, it was tough. It was tough for me, and it brought me to tears as well. In, in closing, on, I strongly desire the chance to be the father my children deserve, and I pray and ask that you, the court who give me first offenders and to be granted time served and any of the remainder sentence to be served on pro probation. In addition, please merge counts three and four under OCGA 16-1-7B as well as run all sentences, sentences concurrent. I strongly can ask that you consider what Ms. Ms. Uh, Good said, because she speaks for the children and their, and their wishes. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, could you also grant an appellant attorney if I decide to appeal? Thank you, Mr. Wimbush. Mrs. Wimbush, this is your opportunity to make your statement before sentencing. Your Honor, my husband and my children are my world. In fact, the wife and mother that I am define me and are how I evaluate my self-worth. Many times on this journey, I've questioned whether my efforts as a wife and a mother have been a complete failure. Then I'm reminded of just how extraordinary all 10 of our children are. And I reflect on what Jesus said a bad tree cannot produce good fruit, and a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. This was a lesson we studied frequently at home and is why we worked so hard to ensure that the fruit that we bore and sent out into the world would not only be great people and great citizens, 
but that they would go out and be a light to nations. Even that they would let their light so shine before men that they would see their good works and glorify their Father which is in the heavens. My children are my everything, not just merely children, but peoples whose minds, whose bodies, and spirits must be respected. In fact, I was very cautious about what I put my body through when I carried them, even what I put in my body when I carried them and refused any drugs when I labored and delivered them. And ultimately why, when we understood that we are, we are not in the place of Elohim, we halted immunizations and allowed their bodies to develop their own immunities and strength. My husband is my best friend. He loves hard and I absolutely love and adore him. He has been an amazing provider and made sure that we did not have a want or need for anything. I praise him for all that he has done and for his commitment to his family. Truly, in all this, he is innocent and shall have been exonerated. This entire situation lies on my shoulders. I sought to ensure that my oldest son, who stood literally at the gate that leads to the wide road of possibilities that ultimately leads to destruction. That I had to ensure he fully understood the choice he was making. See, my oldest son is truly a genius. Everything he touches literally turns gold. There's nothing he can't do when he sets his mind to accomplish something. I needed him to sit down and stop and think without the typical distractions in life and discuss, meditate over, and decide who he desired to be and what path he desired to travel. The most frightening thought for me was not his death, but him walking a path that two of his uncles had walked, the prison pipeline. Not my son. As brilliant and as phenomenal as he is, I desired the world for him. And so he had to be stopped in his tracks. That gate, which was cracked, had to be closed. And we had to evaluate the choices between the wide and narrow gates. I have to say, the day he almost drowned frightened me. But I figured the need to be saved was monumental and showing him that sometimes you'll need a little help. Funny thing is, he's a lot like me because I don't like to have to ask for help either. Nevertheless, I must say that on this journey, the best gift I could have received was a simple letter from my young man, a few words, just like his dad, saying that he now understood the value of righteousness, or as he said, doing what is right. <laughs> the choice has now been made, and it's the choice that I hoped he would make. So now, while Jesus had one lost sheep out of a hundred that had strayed, <clears throat> that had strayed away, and he had to go and get that sheep that got stuck in the crack and couldn't get itself out. I had one little boy that strayed from the other nine and had to be saved and added back to the fold. And now they, though scattered about, are a complete ten again. Ilana, truly, everything about our life revolves around our children. When I looked to Isaiah, I recall, that, I recall the doctor saying that it was scar tissue, and Joy remembers soft tissue. Either way, the doctor in no way made me to think that it was anything serious. And so although I didn't like the way that the little keloid bump looked, I was not so inclined to make my son into a specimen or a scientific experiment to tickle my fancy or my desire for his tummy to look just like everyone else's. 
Ultimately, he has always been happy, healthy, and always full of energy, bouncing off the walls, just a spirit that ebbs and flows. So who was I to take that high quality of life away from him for a keloid scar that didn't bother him, didn't hurt him, and never grew? ultimately giving no rise to the need to obtain a cancer diagnosis. My children just didn't get sick. So I have to tell you, this 31 months without being able to see, to talk to, or even write these little people, my students, <laughs> my children, my world, that I labored for up to 49 hours, that I've been cut open for, and I've nursed for up to two years and two months, who spent every waking hour of every waking day that I've spent with them since their conception. These have been the hardest days of my life. Again, my family, especially my husband and my children, are my world. I seek today to go home so that we can go and get our precious little sheep and all 10, and bring them home, love them, <clears throat> hug them, kiss them, raise them, teach them, train them, educate them, appreciate them, correct them, and hold them, even protect them. My Isaiah, I need to get him to Dr. Rafkin, who was fully aware of this rare dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, and able to properly treat my son to limit his discomfort. I need to hug his neck, and tell him that it's okay and that he'll be fine. Your Honor, Isaiah is one of the most loving children you'll ever meet. I call him spirit because that's just what he is. I tell you, Your Honor, my future is very bleak without them. It's interesting in parenting that you can try your hardest to do everything right and still err. And such a grave error when trying just to keep my child from walking a path I've seen his other relatives walk, that ironically walk, we wind up on that same path. I have many regrets, many regrets. I tell you, knowing now that my son is walking on that path <laughs> that leads to life, that truly means the world to me. Have I been a perfect mother? No. <laughs> Have I been a perfect wife even? No. But I work hard each and every day. To grow, learn, and change in this life. I so want to go hug my little Ricardo and let him know that I'm sorry. To hug all the other nine and let them know it's not their fault, not even his fault. It's all mama's fault. Not even daddy's fault. It's all mommy's fault. <laughs> it's always amazing to hear people talk about my children, how amazing and how phenomenal they truly are. And all this, they've been fearless. They have exceeded my own thoughts, opinions, even expectations of them. As it pertains to Mr. Mayfield's recommendation of uh, serving, of a 30-year total sentence, 20 years to be served in confinement, 
for a charge of cruelty to children in the second degree. Your Honor, typically those people charged with cruelty to children in the second degree are granted bail. Moreover, usually they're granted probation. And so truly, having served two years, seven months, I'd ask that you grant me time served and to serve any remainder of any sentence to be served on probation so that I can go home and try to put my family back together. I'd also like to ask the court in your wide discretion to allow me to use first offenders as this is my very first criminal conviction. As Dad said, not a lifetime criminal at all in my mind trying to do what's best for my children to keep them off this path. I'm also asking that any sentences on, on these counts be run, con, run concurrent. Um, I have here a case with reverse state 275 GA APP 110 2005 um, and I have a copy for the court for Mr. Mayfield and for Mr. Wimbush where in this case um, yeah. Withrow was <sighs> convicted of multiple counts of cruelty to children in the first degree. Um, and the court decided that three counts of cruelty to children in the first degree. The court decided that because the acts constituted a continuing criminal course of conduct, that they were not punishable separately. And based on this case, I'd like to move the court in pursuant to OCGA 1617B, I'd like to move the court to merge counts three and four um, as being acts that constitute a continuing criminal course of conduct um, that they not be punished separately certainly that their sentences not be run concurrently but in fact that those counts be merged your honor in this case we are not charged with being malicious towards our children we're charged with being negligent and I agree with the jury in that, that we were negligent. And I wish we had done things very differently and futuristically I'm certain we will. further I just I asked the court again to merge counts three and four to allow me to use first offenders to run any sentences concurrent and to grant me time served so that I can leave today um, and to serve the remainder of any sentence on probation so that I can get home and begin putting our life back together thank you thank you mrs. Wimbush. Mr. Mayfield, your, your response to the merger issue? No, Your Honor. No response? No, Your Honor. Uh, they, they, the, the two counts allege two completely separate uh, wrongs. Uh, it's not a continuing offense of one. It is two separate wrongs. Therefore, it's not subject to merger. Okay. All right. And I'll give you the final word on any other issue before no, sentencing. Honor. 
All right, give me just a moment. First of all, I want to say to the defendants that being a parent is the hardest job in the world, but it is also probably the job that carries the greatest responsibility in the world. And there is not a parent in this room, there is not a parent in this world that is perfect, but as parents, we need to tread lightly with the responsibility that we have. The sentence that I'm going to impose is not a condemnation of your religious beliefs. It is not a condemnation or a statement for or against corporal punishment that is permitted under the law. It's not a condemnation of how an individual or particular parent chooses to discipline a child so long it is as it is within the bounds of the law. And what has been a key theme throughout the evidence in the trial of this case is what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. And being entrusted with that precious gift of being a parent, having life experience, financial resources, the educational background that each of you have, that light bulb never came on for you as to where that line of reasonableness should have been drawn. And you far exceeded anything that could possibly be considered reasonable in your treatment. And I found it more of an aggravating circumstance, particularly with regard to your oldest child, whose name I'm not going to continue to put in the record, who was confined to the basement, that he was segregated for such unusual, inhumane, and harsh treatment separately. He was singled out for that treatment separately from his other nine children. And I cannot imagine in a house of 10 siblings who were otherwise close and accustomed to sharing a room together and having fun and reading and playing and building Legos and knitting, what that could have felt like. What did I do that was so wrong that I needed to be singled out and treated so differently from all of my siblings in the presence of all of my siblings? In life, we all have choices, decisions, and consequences. And you had choices. Both of you had choices. You would go off to work every day, Mr. Wimbush, come home knowing that your child had been confined in the basement, that he had been denied um, hygiene, interaction with his siblings, the opportunity as a kid to learn that I've made a mistake but it's not a, a condemnation on me for the rest of my life. I should be able to apologize to my parents for breaking the house rules and be treated equally as all the other siblings in that house. And you didn't give him that opportunity as a child. You had those choices. You made the decision as parents, whether it was for religious beliefs, for disciplinary reasons, for whatever reasons, but it far exceeded any bounds of reasonableness. And so now there are consequences for those actions. It was heartbreaking to see the children testify, but yet I saw that they are 
in some respects, amazing children. But I also know that children have an uncanny ability to be resilient, to be malleable, to be adaptable. And that's even more heartbreaking in this case because your oldest child adapted to those unreasonable, inhumane, and unlawful circumstances that were imposed on him. Children have a gift that is an uncanny gift for unconditional love and forgiveness. Yet you, as a worldly adult, educated, financial resources, came to the decision that your child did not deserve forgiveness for taking food, a book, a DVD player. For that, he no longer deserved to be forgiven by his parents. That is incomprehensible. So while I am going to impose a consequence that I believe is within the choices and decisions that you made, I am thankful that hopefully there is a light for your children after these circumstances. The sentence that I'm going to impose is going to be the same sentence for each defendant and it is going to be an aggregate sentence. I will announce the aggregate sentence and then break it down. It will be an aggregate sentence of 30 years with 20 years to serve in custody as to each defendant, the remaining 10 years to be served on probation. It will be broken down as follows. Count three as to each defendant will be 10 years to serve in confinement. Count four will be 10 years probation consecutive to count three. Count seven will be 10 years to serve in confinement consecutive to counts three and four for a total or aggregate sentence for each defendant of 30 years with 20 years to serve in custody. Any credit for time previously served will be determined by the custodian. You'll be subject to both general and special conditions of probation. Uh, the general conditions of probation will be outlined and, and explained to you by probation. These additional conditions that I am about to announce are special conditions of probation and you should pay careful attention to special conditions of probation because they carry greater consequences if you fail to abide by special consequences up to and including revoking the balance of any sentence that remains to confinement whenever you're released. And I will say, I don't know how much of the 20 years you will serve. That is not up to me. Um, that will be determined by the custodian. The special conditions are as follows. Each of you shall pay a $1,500 fine plus any applicable court costs and surcharges. Upon your release and reporting to probation, you much, must each perform 150 hours of community service. That community service cannot be at any places or locations or with any organizations involving children under the age of 18 years of age and it must be at a location that is approved by probation. With regard to the two named minor child victims, RW and IW, you shall have no contact of any kind, not directly or indirectly, directly with those two named minor children until they reach the age of 21. And that contact must be initiated by the two minor children. You cannot initiate the contact on your own. With regard to your remaining eight biological children who should all be referenced in the report, Mr. Mayfield, by their initials, their gender, and their year of birth only initials, gender, and year of birth only. No unsupervised contact with any of those remaining eight biological children until they each reach the age of 18 years of age. <clears throat> the supervising person for any of those visits must be at least 25 years of age. And that 
uh, contact, um, even though it is being supervised, can only be initiated by the children once they have reached 18 years of age. I'm sorry, until they reach 18 years of age, it must be unsupervised. Once they reach the age of 18, um, it can be unsupervised contact. However, it must be initiated by the children. So let me clear that up. Until they reach 18, it must be supervised by someone who is at least 25 years of age, and it must be initiated by the children. Once each minor child reaches the age of 18, it no longer has to be supervised, but it still must be initiated by the child. When you are released from custody and you gain employment, you cannot work anywhere where you directly or indirectly supervise or manage anyone under the age of 18. These are all the special conditions of probation that I impose. I have taken into consideration um, that each defendant is eligible to be treated as a first offender, although that treatment was only requested by Mrs. Wimbush. Um, taking all of that into consideration, the facts and circumstances of this case, I decline to impose this sentence under the provisions of the First Offender Act. Um, you are each being advised at this time that you have a four-year deadline from the date of the sentence to file a habeas action. Um, at this time, what is important for you to understand is the four-year deadline. Mr. Wimbush, do you understand that time frame to filing a habeas action? Mrs. Wimbush, do you understand that four-year deadline? Yes. Uh, you each also have 30 days to file an appeal of this conviction. Um, and Mr. Wimbush, are you seeking court-appointed counsel to assist you with any appeals or filing your appeal within 30 days? Yes. All right. I will grant that request and you will receive uh, an order designating who your court-appointed counsel uh, will be in this case and um, you need to, uh, they will be instructed to contact with contact you as soon as possible due to the 30-day deadline for filing the notice of appeal. Mrs. Wimbush, what do you wish with regard to appellate counsel? Do you wish the court to appoint someone to represent you? Do you wish to represent yourself or are you going to retain someone? Um, for now, All right, so the record will reflect that um, the court will, would appoint appellate counsel for you upon your request, but I'm hearing from you that you decline to receive that appointment and you, instead you wish to represent yourself for purposes of appeal, is that correct? And you understand the deadlines for the filing of any um, pleadings for purposes of appeal? All right, um, Mr. Mayfield, anything, any questions about the sentence imposed by the court? No, Your Honor, I'll submit the word for you. All right, Mr. Wimbush, do you have any questions about the court sentence? All right, Mrs. Wimbush, do you have any questions about the court sentence? Yeah. All right, that'll be the order of the court then. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Miss uh, Mr. Miss Blend. All right, Miss Blend and Mr. Geary, that concludes your